Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media. Today on Spotlight, one woman's journey to complete Missouri's craft distillery adventure, what you earn at the end. Plus, the history of St. Louis rowing. Our city used to have over a dozen rowing clubs along with Olympic medals. And then the St. Louis Science Center's hands-on exhibit about engineering and architecture. But first, fine dining in a casual atmosphere. How this neighborhood restaurant made it into the New York Times. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. While opening a restaurant is absolutely one of the scariest things you can do and just the biggest risk, people here will support it. My name is Craig Rivard. I'm the executive chef and owner of Little Fox Restaurant. Mowgli Rivard, um, and I'm one of the co-owners with my husband. I just sort of oversee day to day and the big picture of keeping Little Fox true to itself. I think probably the first time I knew that I wanted to be a chef and open my own restaurant was probably at the age of 16 while working at a restaurant here in St. Louis. Maybe starting around 12, my dad would drop me off at the grocery store on Sundays. I'd have my shopping list and I would do all of it myself and then, you know, like cook for the week. So I just have always enjoyed meal planning and cooking. I ended up doing a hospitality bachelor's degree, decided as sort of a graduate program for myself, I would go to culinary school. I chose the Culinary Institute of America out in Hyde Park, New York. During my time there, I did my externship down in the city at Gotham Bar and Grill and just fell in love with New York City, that pace of everything. Then moved into the Brooklyn food scene shortly thereafter, sort of leaving the fine dining scene behind and taking the same technique and attention to detail and ingredients, but in a more casual atmosphere. Both cooks by trade. We met in a restaurant in New York, and then we're lucky enough to do some traveling and live in Europe for a while. We've enjoyed developing our love for food and restaurants together. So we definitely knew that's what made sense for us, was to open a restaurant. Then we ended up deciding St. Louis was where we really wanted to do it. So we would often Travel back, visit family, keep an eye on the, the food scene here and what was going on. And we were genuinely just really excited about what was going in, on in St. Louis. Knew eventually we wanted to be a part of that. We were coming from Brooklyn. And then I think for me, it was like that all the brick that's here, sort of like Brooklyn is. I think it was just like we can sort of just try and create this, this little mini Brooklyn here. It was You know, we would sort of canvas neighborhoods whenever we were back visiting family, and this neighborhood really stuck out to us. Bought a house in the same neighborhood as the restaurant, about a block and a half away, I get to walk to work. and You just see so many people walking their dogs and families, and being able to create more things that you don't have to get in your car to do. Both working and dining in the Brooklyn food scene, the way that people approached food there, uh, caring about where it came from, sort of that fluidity of menu based on you know what's showing up around from the farmers and things like that. Just loved eating like that and wanted to replicate that here. We're a modern neighborhood restaurant. And people said, what's that? And I said, just come. And that, for me, has been the most rewarding, is usually when people have left, they're like, I totally get that and they just enjoy themselves. This is simple food done well. It doesn't hit you over the head, but it can really like blow your mind. Craig and I were in Chicago just for a little trip. Another restaurant owner just like texted us, congratulations on the New York Times list. And we're like, what are you talking about? Sure enough, it was 50 restaurants they were most excited about. Obviously being a New Yorker, have had a subscription to the New York Times for a very long time. It was very meaningful, for sure. That was, a, that was a, a big shock. Really flattering and humbling to be recognized for what we were doing in this little corner in St. Louis. I always was so excited to be able to open a restaurant with him because I just, his food so phenomenal. So I'm really proud to see people love it so much. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. 
HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. So the first one I have here um, is our Volsuds Folly Gin. Jaime Blum's recent visit to Still 630 in St. Louis. I like him. Marked her 30th okay. spirits tasting. So right here I'm pouring our Missouri bourbon for you. She um, recently completed a tour of 29 four. craft distilleries across Missouri, the, um, including Still 630, okay. tasting all kinds of liquor along the way. This one is like, is that uh, 81 proof? This is 81 and this is 100. Well, this is a strong already 81. We call it yeah. evil because it's 100. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like it. <laughs> so it might be surprising to learn. Oh, this one's strong. <laughs> that Jaime doesn't <laughs> particularly care for hard alcohol. I don't really drink vodka or, or whiskey. In fact, she didn't really set out to go on that tour of craft distilleries. She'd planned on visiting a winery. That's how I found it was coincidence. The winery was closed. Let's go to the distillery. <laughs> and they show us the map. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing this. The map was for the Missouri Spirits Expedition, an adventure in the spirit of the Lewis and Clark Expedition that challenges you to discover craft distilleries all around the Show Me State. Everybody's done a trail and other states are doing trails and stuff. That's all played out. A trail has a beginning and an end. An expedition is something that you kind of weave and determine on your own. And that was perfect for the Missouri Spirits Expedition, right? What we're trying to do is showcase the entire state and all the different distilleries that are out there. If you go to Kentucky and you take the bourbon trail, they're all making bourbon and most of the processes are pretty much the same. So you don't get to see a whole lot of different things. Um, but in, on the expedition, you do, some people make bourbon, but there's apple brandy and there's distillery that makes eau de vie and then there's us and we have malt whiskey, Irish style, you know, with a pot still. And there's just all these different expressions of spirits around the state. So it's kind of neat to be able to introduce people to all the possibilities at the same time. The sizes and stories of the distilleries on the expedition vary as well. You can go from the larger operations like Restless Spirits in Kansas City to rural parts of the state, including Loman, Missouri, just outside Jefferson City, where you'll find the family-run Blacksmith Distillery and an old 1950s milk barn. The corn whiskey is the recipe that my family made back before Prohibition. It seems like they, they care for what they do, they love what they do, and they, they want to share that, and that's, that's just amazing. Seeing someone with that passion, passion for something, it's, it's, it's amazing. Now you know why someone who doesn't really drink liquor became obsessed with visiting every distillery on the expedition map. For me, it's not about let's go and have drinks in all these 30 places. It's, Let's go and meet this town and then see how people do things. And once you go to the first two or three, you're like, oh, but they're different. Oh, I wonder how these people made their, their own stuff. You know, you go for the distillery, but then you get to experience what's around. There's really small towns that I will never even think of going, that I'm like, I will never see this. It wouldn't be for this. Plus, I learned a lot. These here are our pot stills. They were handmade here in Missouri to my specifications. We all of that, is, it was, is, it was new for me, and I got to learn all of that. It's, it's, it was very rewarding. Inside this barrel is another perk for those on the expedition. Distillers from across the state added their Missouri bourbon to it back in 2019 when the tour began. A bottle from it is waiting for those who complete the expedition. You can't get this bottle without earning it by completing the expedition. None of the other trails out there have anything that is even remotely close. I think a t-shirt's like the best thing that you can get somewhere else. Jaime earned her bottle. Have you tried it? I haven't because I don't want to open it. I don't want to open it. I'm waiting for one of my friends to finish so I can try hers. <laughs> <laughs> this is our little barrel aging room. This While she was revisiting Still 630, she figured out a better plan. I want to do it again because it's so much fun. Will she take a celebratory drink from the next expedition bottle she earns? 
Ready to take off on your yes. next expedition. Let me give you your first stamp here. For Jaime, that's not the reward she's looking forward to most. All of these people are really nice and they're family-owned businesses and then you get to know and and they're very, I don't know how to explain it, just, it feels like family. That's, 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 that's how I felt. Later on Spotlight, you'll meet a local violin maker. What he says you need to make the perfect one. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, president of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis, and this is History Spotlight. From the mid 19th century into the 1940s, St. Louis had over a dozen rowing clubs, many with elaborate boathouses along the Mississippi River and several with Olympic medals to their name. Public historian Amanda Clark explains. One of my favorite paintings of early St. Louis is this idyllic early morning scene looking across Shoto's Pond, looking towards downtown. It's an 1840s image. We see someone fishing, someone painting, and a group of men out for a row. But those men out for their row are to me the best little detail, and I was so glad when I found it because it cracked open this huge, fascinating, and forgotten chapter in St. Louis sporting history. So competitive rowing was not only a popular sport in St. Louis for over a century, it was one that we excelled at on a national level. When the teams raced, every stroke was covered in the local papers. Thousands of people would line the St. Louis Riverfront to watch the races. Yes, I just said that these teams, for the most part, were rowing on the Mississippi River right alongside the ferries and steamboats. Rowing is an ancient sport, and it's one of our country's first nationally professional sports. Along the Mississippi, it grows from New Orleans north starting in the 1830s. Pretty soon, there's teams from St. Louis, Minneapolis, Quincy, Illinois, and Memphis, and they're all competing against each other in these big regattas. St. Louis's first competitive team was the Western Rowing Club. It was formed in 1868. They dominated locally and nationally for over 80 years. Western Rowing Club even medaled in the 1904 Olympics. Its members were pulled from the top levels of St. Louis society, and its boats were made by the finest shipbuilders in the U.S. And as with many things in St. Louis history, the Beer Barons were involved as well. Two of the most prized local trophies were the Faust Cup, which Western won so many times they retired it, and the Lemp Plate. And in 1873, brewer Joseph Schneider publicly challenged saloonist Henry Huffnagel that a crew couldn't cross the Mississippi in under two and a half minutes large crowd watching on the levee, a Western crew proved him wrong by completing it in two minutes and seven seconds. The club's boathouses used to dot the riverfront from Baden to Carondelet, and they varied from simple riverfront structures to elaborate clubhouses with dock facilities nearby. Only one of the clubhouses still stands, a beautiful building built originally for Western Rowing Club on South Broadway. It was turned into a retirement facility in the 1930s. After capturing our collective attention for almost a century, rowing quickly declined in popularity after World War II. Today, only one historic rowing team still exists, the St. Louis Rowing Club. They were founded in 1875, and their boathouses are located at Creveport Lake. Next week on History Spotlight, brass musician and St. Louisan William Joseph Blue. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We're standing here in our newest exhibit in the current Curiosities Gallery, Dream It, Build It, a exhibit that's hands-on all about construction, architecture, and engineering. This is an exhibit that's really focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and it's hands-on, giving you the opportunity to build with blocks, uh, Kiva planks is what they're called, and these allow you to do some architecture and construction on your own. You'll get to see the ways that you can develop different styles, and the whole time, you're gonna be fighting physics as you're building these gravity-defying structures. 
Dream It, Build It is really a freeform exhibit in that we're not going to tell you how to build these items, uh, these objects, these buildings that you're trying to create. And instead, it's up to you and your imagination. The blocks may be uniform shape, but you can literally build anything out of them here in this gallery. It's not just about the blocks, though. There are going to be panels throughout the exhibit that are going to be talking a little bit about architecture and engineering here in our city of St. Louis. There are a lot of great examples of architecture, and we hope that, one, they'll give you some prompts and ideas of things to try to build here in the gallery, but also a reminder of all the cool icons that we have in our city that add to our skyline. There are a lot of architectural influences here in St. Louis, and you'll get to kind of explore some of those, from the Native Americans who inhabited the area to the first settlers. We have a lot of French influences. Of course, we have our St. Louis Arch, but also our own planetarium here at the Science Center. All these icons are here to inspire you to build your own masterpieces, stir up your own creativity. Who knows, you might be the next great architect building something that's gonna adorn the St. Louis skyline. And that's really core to our mission here at the St. Louis Science Center, to inspire lifelong STEM learning, lifelong technology learning. We can do it hands-on here in this exhibit and throughout the rest of our galleries here at the Science Center. Dream It, Build It is included with your free admission here to the St. Louis Science Center. And you're welcome to spend from minutes to hours here, depending on how much you're enjoying it. You can find out more at slsc.org. HEC Media, supporting and promoting the arts. Check out our features and shows on theater, dance, music, the visual arts, and more. Find this and all our award-winning content at hecmedia.org. Structurally, on a molecular level, are those molecules moving around a lot? What is it that makes a great teacher? One who is creative and truly connects with every student and makes learning fun with humor. <laughs> Greenville Junior High School science teacher Jackie Bloomer is that unforgettable teacher. Allowing kids to be more creative and interactive with what they're doing in science allows a much deeper understanding of what they're learning. If they're excited about what they're learning about, then they're going to understand it better. So I try really hard to make every assignment that I do and every activity, I think a lot, a lot about it, so that what I'm giving them is something that they're going to enjoy. Okay, go. I really like this way of learning because on books you're just reading something and you don't really get how hard it is, but whenever you're doing like actual experience, you're like, wow, how did they do this? Ooh, did you see what's happening there? Yeah. What was it? It fell. What was happening? I like how like I can get taught by like people that actually know about the real stuff. I staged a whole CSI murder unit where the kids had to look at the evidence and figure out who killed the unknown person in the room. To make it even better, I brought in um, a CSI from the Illinois State Police. I brought in the coroner. They both came in and they spoke to my kids about what their job is and how they do it. And that was super eye-opening to them. One of the things that stands out with Jackie Bloomer is her method of inspiring yeah, children okay, to go a little bit further quick, beyond where they, they typically are. They were good. Yay. They were not changing until I pulled them out. So excellent job. So you passed both of your tests. Good yes. job. Yes. We got it. In this class you get to do lots of like hands-on stuff and learning instead of just like reading word for word what's in the book and answering a few questions. You can't do everything on your own. You have to use the whole group. Why we are selling this to you. The Comet 2019 are RDRL is a fashionable and safe space suit. It will help with whoever is, in, whoever is in it and has some neat special features and tools. One of the ways that I take kids out into the real world, um, I've done a few things. This year, uh, my kids were able to go to Challenger Learning Center, which is a hands-on, as close to real world space simulated mission you can get. Jackie's dedication to science education reaches beyond the classroom. She is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics K-12 St. Louis STEM Chair, ALSI-1 Limitless Space Institute Educator, and is the 2022 AIAA and Challenger Learning Center National STEM Trailblazing Award winner. At this honors event, she was also awarded the grand prize of attending the Blue Origin launch of the Shepard rocket. 
Flight Vector, New Shepard is go for launch. Keep it at 5, 4, command is start, 2, 1. Earlier in her career, Jackie Bloomer was one of the elite 26 NASA Explorer School Educator recipients across the United States. During the program, she and a colleague were granted an unforgettable experience of a lifetime to experience weightlessness. It was just fantastic of her to invite me, which is something I had always wanted to do since my childhood. And it was absolutely amazing. It's like no other feeling. The easiest way to explain it, it's kind of like swimming except there's no water. So just a simple movement of just touching a wall and you'd go flying across the cabin. It, it's just that whole Newton's law, you know, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Well, in microgravity, you don't have a force of gravity pushing on you. So you just, you float. Today, inspiring and educating her students is a continued priority for Jackie Bloomer. I want them to know that it is okay to make mistakes and we learn from those mistakes and failure occurs when you don't do anything after you make a mistake. So if you don't succeed at something, you have to keep trying. I think science instruction definitely mirrors the real world. For more St. Louis stories, subscribe to the HEC YouTube channel. Connect STL from HEC Media. I started playing the violin like right after high school and uh, because we had one laying around the house, my dad played a little bit. Sometimes it'll just take you. It's such a weird, mysterious instrument and I just totally got into it and then I thought, I, I've always done stuff with my hands. I used to work on cars, I used to paint cars and do kinds of things like that and I, so I could work with my hands and I thought, well, maybe I could do that. I made my first violin in 1978. So I've been doing it a pretty long time, 45 years almost or something like that. You never really stop learning, to be honest with you. The great violins were made by makers like Antonio Stradivari and Giuseppe Guarneri. And these are makers that were in northern Italy in the late 1600s, early 1700s. They basically perfected the shape of the instrument. There's some principles, there's some like physical principles too. Like there's flexibility, like the, all the pieces need to be flexible but they need to be strong too so that they don't fall apart. So you have to kind of hit this kind of intersection of strength and flexibility. If you hit, hit that target close to the center, you're gonna get a great violin. To make a violin for me takes 300 to 400 hours. Everything kind of starts with a pattern like this. This is the, basically the inside shape of a violin and uh, you can kind of see it just fits in there like this is the pattern this is how it starts we basically start with a piece of wood like a full piece of wood like this this is this is two pieces of wood joined together in the middle and so it's been cut out of that piece of wood like that as you can see this a gouge like this puts really deep flutes in it so so then we have after we get going we have this little thing called a finger plane and the finger plane smooths out the grooves. It'll end up looking kind of like this. So this is this is a plate after after we've done this to it, the finger plane. Then next comes the scraper. So the scraper takes the scraper will take the flute from the finger plane out and smooth it down. So after we're done with that, we turn over and we use the chisel on the inside of it, and then it becomes like that. And this is kind of a semi-finished. But now you can really, you can really hear it. Listen to that. It's already just getting really loud. So that's kind of what, how we make the top and the back. The sides are another story. The sides are actually thin pieces of wood that are bent on a hot iron. So this is a thin piece of wood that was flat and then we dip it in water and we pull it on a hot iron and we bend it. And as you can see, 
it's this shape right in here. So this is the, uh, the back and sides, and then we'll, this is kind of how the box will be made. So then this will be the top here. So this is, this is all just roughed out, but you can kind of see this starting to take shape as, as the violin. And we move on to the neck, and the neck is like, you take a block of wood, and you trace out the rough pattern of the neck and saw that out. And here's a finished, finished scroll, so you can kind of see how that's narrowed down. This is the peg box that's hollowed out, and then, and then of course the scroll is carved. We carve that, that we do that all by hand, and then that'll be set into the the body of the box, and it, and then we're getting pretty close to having it done. I do feel a connection to the to the to the makers of old. I'm doing it kind of the way that they did it. I I have electric lights and I have other you know I have heat and things that they didn't have you know so so much of. Of course they had wood heat or whatever. It's kind of a lot of it's the same. It's the same kind of when you when you chisel the wood. It's the same sound. It's the same. There's a lot of it's a lot of the same stuff. One has to remember tone is subjective. So what I hear and what I like is not necessarily what the next person, let, let's say, had the same skill level that I had, may like something totally different. So it's like if you're a painter and someone comes in and goes, I like your artwork, I wanna buy your painting. It's, a, it's more like that. It's like I, like, I like what I see when you make a violin, I like what you're doing there, and I'm, I wanna have a violin from you. I always say my uh, the technology I work on peaked in 1705. <laughs> they they're not set for improvement. They're not like like other technological things like phones or cars that actually improve with technology. Violins don't improve with technology so much. They just because they're already great. But it is kind of a tool. It's an extension of you. The violin sounds like a human voice. That's why it's so compelling. Week, talented musician William Joseph Blue, the leading black artist in St. Louis in the early 20th century, plus Jamel Brinkley on his collection of short stories. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9:30 a.m. on KPLR 11.